Centennial Symposium Series. I'm Susan Kaplan, the chairman of the series, and my committee and I are pleased to see you here tonight, and we thank you very much for coming. Our thanks also to our panel of distinguished business leaders who will be discussing building a business, planning the future from their personal point of view. I would also like to thank Andover Newton Theological School for hosting this series and Continental Cable Vision for taping all four evenings. This evening's discussion will be seen next Monday on Newton Cable Channel 13 at 7.30 p.m. so that you can watch it all again. I'd like to invite you all to attend a reception in honor of our five participants in the faculty lounge in this building downstairs. I will give you directions at the end of the evening. I want to remind you that this is only one event of many scheduled to celebrate Newton's 300th birthday. Tickets and information about the others are available in the lobby, uh, including garden tours, which will take place this Saturday, two more symposia scheduled for next week. There's also a lot of free concerts, a jazz concert, Dizzy Gillespie and Newton, fireworks, a parade, dance, and so on. The program book is just available this week, and you can also find those out in the lobby. It's a history of Newton, as well as all the events taking place during this celebration. It is now my pleasure to introduce Newton's mayor, the Honorable Theodore D. Mann. Friends, I, you just heard uh, from, just had a sampling, in a sense, of what Newton is all about. It's volunteerism. It's people who care enough about what happens about them, not only in the Newton community, but the greater Newton community, and that encompasses the world. And we've often said if there's a worthwhile cause any place in the world, there's a chapter being formed in Newton Center. <laughs> and that's true. The more I'm involved in Newton activities, the more I realize that it's not only that we have the captains of industry, we have a mix of people that is unusual. Our school system boasts, boasts, I say, of over 57 different ethnic groups. We have a, a mixture of cultures in this city that is unparalleled, I believe. We had a symposia just two nights ago. We had four of the presidents of leading universities, along with Henry Rosowski, the dean over at the Harvard, uh, the Harvard School of uh, Asian Affairs and, uh, and, and other uh, hats that he's worn over the years as, as acting president while Derek Bach was away. And in investigation, we find that we have 11, 11 college presidents calling Newton their home. Where else in America, even in the large metropolitan areas, the large urban areas, would you find such a community? And this evening, we're pleased that in our business community, also captains of industry, and not alone being captains of industry, but they've used their business experience and their acumen to spread out into the fields of community enterprise. Good things for people who haven't made it along the way of life, and I could cite a chapter and verse for all of these gentlemen and lady here. So we have something unique going in Newton, that's why we celebrate this 300th year. So for the people of Newton, I want to once again express our gratitude to you for being here, so we too can become, at best, the members of Fortune 200. <laughs> Why do they live in Newton? I think it's probably because of the great municipal services provided. <laughs> <laughs> some say schools, some say the hospital, medical service, and two, uh, uh, in this audience we have several individuals who are president of our hospital here, Newton Wellesley Hospital. We think of the greater Boston area, and we think of medicine, and we think of the contributions being made by these people to medicine throughout this region. So we're again, uh, we're delighted that they are with us here tonight, and this is but the beginning. And now I take a great pleasure again in introducing one of our college presidents. And what a remarkable experience it is for me to be here this evening and two evenings ago 
And here the president of Brandeis, Evelyn Handler, representing her views on the mission of public education, coming from a perspective where the Jewish community, in response to the wonderful things that the universities like Andover Newton and Boston University have done in allowing the emerging minorities to become part of their educational system. And having George Peck, their president and longtime residents of our community, representing his people where he, the influence of Andrew Newton is worldwide. And then listening to Father Monin, the president of Boston College, the largest Catholic post-secondary institution in the United States. And of course, Henry Rosowski is all by himself. And David Knapp, the president of the universities of Massachusetts and that educational system here. So with that, I thought I would impart to you some of the things that I have discovered so you don't have to spend all the time trying to discover for yourself. <laughs> and I pleasure in introducing uh, the president of Andover Newton who, with his generosity of time and generosity of the use of the facilities here, is making our 300 such a memorable event in all of our lives. Well, you're welcome, please, or let us say thank you to uh, George Peck, President of Andover Newton. Mr. Mayor, distinguished panel, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Andover Newton. You probably didn't even know it was here <laughs> until tonight. <coughs> now you know. Please do not make this the last time you visit our campus. Pay no attention to the no trespassing signs. <laughs> they are not meant for you. The police tell us we have to have them there. But uh, we encourage people to wander around this lovely campus. It has been a campus since 1825. Before that, it was a farm, 85 acres. It was purchased in 1825 by the Baptist denomination for a seminary, and they paid the princely sum of $4,000. Uh, we won't speculate about what it's worth now. In 1807, in Andover, Massachusetts, a seminary had been begun by the Congregational Community. So Newton was a Baptist school and Andover was a Congregational school. They came together in 1931 and formed the Andover Newton Theological School. We are a graduate institution, students from all over the United States and from many parts of the world, preparing for ministry in a number of denominations. We take a great deal of pride in our campus and in our programs and we urge you to spend some time every now and then visiting this part of Newton. We are proud to be able to host these events and we are delighted that you are here with us this evening. It is, I think, especially appropriate that we are hearing tonight from members of the business community since at Andover Newton a few years ago we established a chair to study business ethics and the business community and economics in relation to religious issues. We also spend a good deal of our time here talking about what we call the theology of institutions, reflecting on the role of institutions in society and the role that our graduates have in helping people to understand the significance of those institutions. So we are delighted you're here. We look forward to a very interesting evening. And please do come back again. Thank you.
chairperson of the Women's Lunch Group in Boston and many more. Ms. Corman is also a columnist for the Boston Herald. A prominent business leader in her own right, Nancy Corman, our moderator. Thank you very much for those kind words. I'm going to ask my secretary first thing tomorrow morning to cut my resume in half. <laughs> It is a pleasure for me to have the opportunity to moderate such a distinguished panel. I have always thought that both individuals and cities contained self-fulfilling prophecies. When I moved to the Boston area some 20 years ago, I discovered that every time I met a bright, interesting man or woman, they had one common quality. They lived in Newton. And so, I, a girl from New York, decided that that was where I would settle down. I wanted to be where the activists were. I think my decision was a typical one. As a result of this prophecy, Newton is indeed filled with people who have a sense of purpose, who have vigor, commitment, and energy. You are about to hear from some of the stars. But keep in mind that success comes in many forms and many styles. Tonight, our speakers are male, but this is a city filled with women who have been the first in their respective fields, from medicine to the arts, from law to politics, and from science to business. On other evenings of this tricentennial, you will hear from other leading citizens as well. The men, of course, have not done too badly, as evidenced by our panelists. The format tonight will be as follows. We will hear from each of the panelists. They will give you a personal perspective of their lives, their goals, their experiences. After the panelists have spoken, there will be an opportunity for dialogue and questions from the panelists and the audience. So please, jot down any questions that come to mind. We expect you to be an active audience. And now, we will begin. Jack Connors, Jr. is a founding partner of Hill Holiday, one of the world's leading advertising agencies. Mr. Connors supervises the entire business operation of this giant agency's international network. In his 19 years as president, Jack Connors has built an agency with an outstanding reputation. The agency has been a unique one from the very beginning, and I remember its earliest days. The style of advertising, like Jack Connors himself, has always been forward-looking and bold, and that style has worked over and over again, from grassroots political campaigns to corporate giants. <clears throat> there is really nothing that quite matches Irish charm. <laughs> Jack Connors is a native Bostonian, a Boston College graduate, and a trustee of the Boston Ballet, the Catholic Charitable Bureau, the John F. Kennedy Library, and Boston College, just to name a few. He has contributed enormous style to the world of advertising and he has contributed financially and with energy to the world of politics and charity. It is a pleasure to welcome my good friend, Jack Connors, here this evening. I didn't mean to cut you short, Nancy, if you want. <laughs> Mayor Mann, I'd like to congratulate you on your 300 years as president of Newton. <laughs> This is a wonderful campus, and we all appreciate your making these facilities available this evening. I must say, we've been in Newton for just shy of 20 years, and this is the first time I ever knew where this place was. <laughs> it's beautiful, and congratulations on all the good work that you do. I will take, uh, I think each speaker takes a certain measure to determine the success, and the measure of my success will be if this young lady here in the first row is awake by the time I get through. <laughs> I must say that uh, this is an unusual forum for me, an unusual kind of a gathering. 
but I'm really quite pleased to be here, particularly when I reflect on the fellow members of, of the panel. It really does remind me of the sense of community here in Newton. Uh, one of them is responsible for entertaining me on Saturday evenings through his theaters. Another used to be my landlord on a piece of property on Newbury Street, and a third serves fine food to my family on many occasions. <laughs> <laughs> and Nancy and I go way back, and uh, I think it was 1970 or 1970, wasn't it, when we both, as a couple of youngsters, worked, uh, at least it was my first political campaign for a gentleman by the name of Father Robert Trina. So it's really quite a experience to be with you and with these folks on the panel. I'll just share, if I may, a little bit of who I am and how I got here and where I hope to go from here. I grew up in, in Boston, the city of Boston, a, a neighborhood called Roslindale, and went to, to Boston College, left Boston to learn the advertising business on Madison Avenue in New York, and came back to Boston in 1966 to join a company called Batten, Barton, Durstein, and Osborne. Jack Benny used to say it sounded like a piece of luggage falling down the steps. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of years later, at the ripe old age of 25, knowing everything there was to know about starting a business and managing a business, or at least thinking so at the time, I started a business with three associates, and we modestly named the company after ourselves, Hill Holiday Connors Cosmopolis. There was a telephone strike at the time, so we went to the bank and got a roll of dimes or several rolls of, dime, rolls of dimes and called everyone we had ever met to announce that we were in the advertising business. And we couldn't get any, uh, any phones installed in our little office in a loft just above Papagala Shoe Store on Newbury Street. It was a classic beginning. Uh, that first year, we did a quarter of a million dollars in billings, and after 10 years, we were only doing about $15 million in billings, and today, actually tomorrow is the 20th anniversary of our company and we will close the books uh, tomorrow with just a little over $300 million in billing. We've become legends in our own mind. <laughs> <laughs> We're actually the, uh, the number one agency in New England in terms of size and the number 29 agency in, in the world. And we've had some great experiences and great associations with people, uh, primarily based here. Back in 1974, there was a small company doing $70 million a year in sales uh, run by a Chinese immigrant, uh, Dr. Wang, and they were spending $180,000 a year in advertising. And uh, Dr. Wang had the sense of humor to hire this small advertising agency. And it was really a classic story. All the sophisticated advertisers, the Polaroids and the Gillettes, was it something I said? <laughs> <laughs> and so on. Well, 
companies and various businesses also caught some of those waves, and in our case, we were really quite fortunate. Boston was always a backwater town in the advertising business. When, when I came here, uh, the largest company in Boston was the one I worked for, BBDO, Batten, Barton, Durstein, Osborne. They were doing about $10 million in billings. And today, some 22 years later, we're at the $300 million mark. And people always said, what made you think that you could do it in Boston? And what made you think that you could build something very special on your own terms and in your own town and, and live in, in a neighborhood uh, six and a half miles away from, from your office in the John Hancock Tower now? And when I hear that question, I'm reminded of a classic story, a story that Walt Disney told. And what uh, those of you who have been down to Disney World, the kids all go for those sort of Star Wars or space adventures into the, the dark cylinders and go at 800 miles an hour through the various adventures. But uh, at my age, you're not interested in those kinds of things. And there's a Gulf Oil exhibit just as you walk in the, the main entrance. And in that exhibit is the story of Walt Disney. And what makes it a fascinating story is it's narrated by Walt Disney. Uh, so obviously it was done while he was alive. Now, Disney told what he called his favorite story. <coughs> And it was about a circus at the turn of the century. And, and the, as the circus would move from town to town, uh, the, it would be necessary to hire two or three temporary workers to help put the whole show together. And in this particular town, among other things, they needed a trombone player. And the ringmaster was quite busy, but uh, a young boy of uh, 12 or 13 years of age uh, pulled, tugged on his jacket and asked him if he could have the job as the trombone player. The ringmaster was distracted. He said, look, you've got the job, and uh, the uniform's are over here, the trumpets, are, the trombone's over here, and I'll give you two tickets to the circus uh, at the other end of town. And so they, they set up for parade, marched through to get the attention of all the townspeople, and at the other end of town, uh, they would pitch uh, the tents and so on, set up the circus. And as they began the parade, it became uh, very obvious to, uh, to everyone that this young man uh, could not master the trombone. In fact, his music was painful. And it was quite distracting and almost threw everybody off. And at the end of the, the parade route, uh, the ringmaster came up to the boy and he said, why didn't you tell me you couldn't play the trombone? I'll give you the tickets anyway, but that was embarrassing. Why didn't you tell me you couldn't do that? And the young boy looked up at him and he said, I didn't know I couldn't play the trombone. I'd never tried it before. <laughs> and essentially that's that's the whole history of our company. It hadn't been done, and uh, we've had a great deal of fun in doing it. We have uh, some four offices around the world in Hong Kong and London and New York, but our home is in Boston. We've got 80 people in London and 25 in Hong Kong and another 75 or 80 in New York, but we have about 350 people in Boston. And no matter where I go, uh, the favorite part of the trip is when you, you fly back into Logan Airport and see that spectacular skyline and come back into the office and then head for home. We live on Ward Street in Newton. In fact, I'm one of the few Irish Americans you'll ever meet that has two temples on his street. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, very convenient. <laughs> in the advertising business, you try and get along with everyone. So. <laughs> I'm on the board of trustees of Boston College, and I've been to a couple of bas mitzvahs, or bar mitzvahs at the Temple Emanuel, so I'm hedging all my bets, uh, <laughs> not sure which way to turn the time. I've had a great deal of good fortune uh, in setting up a business, primarily for one reason, and that is that uh, I've been able to surround myself with very talented people. There's a, uh, there's a story about a man who did, uh, a fellow by the name of Bill Burnback, who was one of the legends of the advertising business. He did ads that you all fell in love with at one point or another, the old Volkswagen ads and the Polaroid ads and the We Try Harder from Avis back in the late 50s, early 60s. And at his first Christmas party, his first company Christmas party back in, I guess, 1948, one of his uh, employees from the accounting department came up to him and, he, and asked Mr. Burnback what it was going to take to be successful in, in his agency. And he thought about it for a moment, and he was always extraordinarily talented at boiling things down to the simplest essence, and that's what made his advertising so appealing. And he said, it's really going to take two things to be successful here. The people who work here have to be talented, and they have to be nice. And if they're talented but not nice, there's no room for them here, because all we are are people and a community. And if 
they're nice but not talented, they're going to have to find a job somewhere else. And we can learn from all of the past. Uh, the history is the greatest teacher, regardless of what uh, area we're talking about. And in this particular case, our lesson was if it was good enough for Bill Burnback, then it was going to be good enough for us. So we have the opportunity, because of our growth, to create a lot of opportunities for younger people. And when they come in, uh, it's very simple. If they're talented and if they're nice, if they're bright and if they're thoughtful, then uh, more often than not, they'll have a chance to, to come to work at Hill Holiday and, and hopefully have an opportunity to grow. We also noticed uh, two or three years ago that several of the women that worked for us were getting a little chubby around the stomach. And first we thought it was the water, and then we thought it may have something to do with biology and their age. And uh, we realized that a lot of very talented people that worked with us were getting pregnant. And uh, we'd seen this on the outside, but never seen it on the inside. And so what we decided was uh, we couldn't really afford to lose these people because good people are hard to find. So we set up what, if I'm not mistaken, is the first daycare center in the advertising business and now is uh, the only daycare center in the advertising business in Boston. <laughs> and uh, someone came to us and said, that's going to be a very expensive venture. Uh, and we, our reaction to that was, uh, how expensive could it be? These people, you, you pay search firms or personnel consultants all kinds of money. Uh, we probably, in our category, uh, are used to seeing agencies spend a half a million, six, seven hundred thousand dollars a year to find people. And if you've already found them and can keep them, then why not, uh, why not hold on to the people that you have? And it's been an absolutely fascinating experience. People in the beginning said, you don't have enough opportunities here. You've only got seven pregnant women, and uh, you're building a daycare center for 36 children. Why don't you uh, sort of make it a joint venture with someone else? And I said, well, who, who did you have in mind? And they said, well, the Women's Legal Association of Boston would like to joint venture with us. Is it the Women's Legal Association? In other words, you're suggesting that I go into business with 18 lawyers <laughs> and hope to come out of this ahead. <laughs> I said, I tell you what, you tell them the good luck on their end, and we're going to build our own daycare. And it's really been a very special experience. And the way it's worked so successfully is because teachers are paid so poorly relative to people in industry, which is a great shame in this nation, uh, that if you pay a teacher, uh, if, if he or she makes uh, $20,000, $25,000 in the, in the systems, in the public systems, and you pay them $35,000, Unfortunately, you have a line of candidates uh, for that position. That's good for us, but it doesn't say much for, for the school systems around, around the nation. So now we're in the advertising business, and now we're in the daycare business. And uh, it's been a very special experience. We've, we've had some good fortunes, uh, good fortunes to meet all of the people that are, that are on the panel tonight, good fortune to uh, be introduced by Nancy, and a good fortune to uh, share 15 or, or so minutes with you. Thanks for this opportunity. I wish you well. <coughs> Did I tell you there was nothing quite like Irish charm? <laughs> Do you think I feel badly? I started my tiny little agency the same year out of the same campaign that Jack Connor started his. The only time I have ever felt worse was when I co-hosted with my husband a fundraising event. I cooked, Anthony Spinozola came, he came directly to the kitchen, and the honored guest of the evening was Candace Bergen. I turned to my husband and I said, Candace Bergen is in the living room, Anthony Spinozola is in the kitchen, and I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jack, you've done it again to poor me. <coughs> Our next speaker, Richard Smith, is Chairman of the Board and Chief Executive Officer of the General Cinema Corporation. To the world, it's a Fortune 500 company. To me, it's the place I drop off four children every week. In addition to operating one of the leading theater chains in the United States, General Cinema is the major independent bottler of Pepsi-Cola, Dr. Pepper, and 7-Up products. The firm also owns a majority interest in the Neiman Marcus Group. Personally, I consider that an asset worth noting. Mr. Smith is a graduate of Harvard University. 
a director of the First National Bank of Boston, and the Liberty Mutual Insurance Company. He is vice chairman of the board of the Dana-Farber and a trustee of the Boston Symphony Orchestra. He is also vice president of the United Cerebral Palsy Foundation and an honorary trustee of the board of Beth Israel Hospital and Combined Jewish Philanthropies. We are delighted to have the opportunity to hear from Richard Smith. Thank you, Nancy. Um, I guess everybody realizes I drew the short straw here and had to follow Jack Connors. Um, with that silver tongue and that good sense of humor, uh, I hope you can relax and listen to a straight man for a few minutes, because I'm not in that league in making presentations. However, I do live in Newton. I've lived here for 35 years. My wife, Sue, who's with me tonight, has lived here all her life. Um, you ask me why I live in Newton. Uh, I don't say because the office is there. I was fortunate, and I was able to move our company's headquarters to Newton about 10 years ago, and we're very happy to live near the office and happy that both home and office are in Newton. Now, on a more serious note, perhaps, um, I uh, brought a few notes, and I'll try to get through them rapidly because we don't really have enough time for everyone to say uh, what ought to be said tonight on all the subjects we have to cover. But um, I think it's appropriate that uh, since the first settlers of the Newton area came here in pursuit of freedom, that we ought to recognize tonight that economic freedom, economic freedom to build businesses, to create jobs, to stimulate consumption, and to ensure that the capital to continue the process on into the future is the basis on which the growth of this entire area has been consummated, and the basis on which it will continue. We are a free enterprise city, we're a free enterprise state, and we're a free enterprise nation. And so I think it is appropriate for a few minutes to talk to you about how a local company became kind of a free enterprise miracle, one that we're very proud of. General Cinema was actually built on a series of key strategic decisions. These were, um, um, oh, there were many strategic decisions, but I've selected just seven of them tonight to try to give you a sense of what our story is all about. Key decision number one. Once upon a time, there was a small Boston-based chain of small-town New England theaters run by a far-sighted gentleman who lived in this area. And he could foresee long before, his, before it took place, long before World War II, in fact, the great growth of suburban USA that was coming. He realized that popular entertainment could be provided 10, 20, 30 miles out from Central City, USA. And that with faith in the, in the validity of that basic idea, he built the first profitable operating drive-in theaters in the United States. He put them in Detroit and Cleveland, where America's love affair with the automobile really began. The time, 1934. The country was in the depths of the Great Depression. General Cinema was born with that gentleman's vision and guts to make a key decision. That man would have been 89 years old this week, and perhaps if there's anyone old enough around here, they might have remembered him. He happened to have been my father, Philip Smith. In the years that followed, General Drive-In, as our company was known in those years, uh, became prosperous, and in fact, in the year just before World War II, uh, when construction of such theaters stopped, General Drive-In operated nine of the 15 drive-in theaters in the United States and had established the first such theaters in half a dozen different states. All of this led on after the war to decision, key decision number two. 
1950 was the year, and the place was Framingham, not far from here, the first regional shopping center in the United States. And again, our company management group, at this time we began to have a group, had the vision to foresee the, the fast growth of suburban shopping and suburban areas. And we built and undertook to open the first shopping center theater in the United States in that year. That wasn't an easy thing to do because the indoor theaters, theater business had been decimated in those years by the advent of free television for everyone. And many, many thousands of theaters had closed. And in fact, this beautiful theater, the Cinema at Framingham, which I suppose many of you have visited over the years, opened up and lost money for the first three or four years. It took that long for people to get the idea. And to be a pioneer sometimes takes patience and money and love and devotion and, and the ability to meet many, many challenges. At any rate, over time, that was a successful endeavor. And it gave birth to a whole new industry, the shopping center theater business. After Framingham came the twins and the triples and the multiplex theaters that you see all over America. And in fact, our company was the first to build a twin shopping center theater. And it all derived from that. Decision number three. The year was 1960. Drive-in theaters were by now present everywhere. Shopping th center theaters existed in very few places, even in 1960. But, and there was reason for that, because over the years, the people who financed shopping centers had lost a great deal of money on their old mortgages financing indoor theaters. So it took a spe the creation of a special kind of a financial vehicle, known in conventional parlance as a public company, to provide the basis on which General Drive-In could expand and diversify its drive-in theater business into the now proven format, proven in Framingham, of the shopping center theater business nationally. So we did go public, not to raise money from the public, but to establish a name that could become known and a financial competence and reliability that could make possible the financing of a national chain of theaters. We, d we did that in 1960, and together with the first two decisions, those three decisions laid the foundation for the future growth and prosperity of what is now General Cinema. If you had um, bought a share of stock in 1960, you would have paid about five cents a share for what is now about an $18 a share public security on the New York Stock Exchange. Few people did, and we're very, very proud of those people that did and stayed with it, because they put a lot of kids through college on that stock, and it still gives us great pleasure to hear about that from time to time. Well, General Cinema then followed along, and there was accelerated growth nationally, and in the 60s we did quite well growing that theater chain, but in 1968 we come up to key decision number four. This uh, was an, a time when General Cinema's theaters were generating lots of cash. And we had this public company, and it had stockholders who wanted growth. And the simple way to get them growth would have been to have just built many, many hundreds of additional theaters, and maybe eventually thousands of additional theaters. But we felt that we wanted to diversify this company. We enjoyed businesses. And we looked at businesses that were um, consumer-oriented, youth-oriented, and, youth and uh, leisure-time-oriented, and we landed on the soft drink business. So for our first major diversification, we bought a then-public company called American Beverage. It was listed on the American Stock Exchange. And that company led us into the business of Pepsi-Cola bottling. Pepsi-Cola bottling became for us one of the, and for, for any company, one of the most successful diversification programs that any American company has ever undertaken. That division is today over a $700 million annual business. There are 29 beverage plants and over 40 distribution centers. We're primarily in the Middle West and in, uh, along the East Coast and in the South. 
and we are the largest independent bottler of Pepsi-Cola products. We sell, will sell this year about 110 million cases of beverages, and that's over 5 billion individual drink servings. So it's a big operation. But it's sort of interesting to think back about the key decision that led to it, uh, other than the uh, search for diversification. Uh, in 1968, this company was available to us, and we negotiated a deal with the then uh, chairman uh, to buy it for $16 million, an astronomical sum for our company to uh, undertake at the time. And uh, we worked on that acquisition, I did, for uh, almost two years before we could make it. And then when it came up to close the deal, the gentleman decided that he wanted to keep his company, he didn't want to sell. We were able to persuade him at the last minute over a Christmas weekend that we wanted to buy his company, we had worked too long, too hard, name a crazy price, tell us what you want. At which point he said that, well, for two million dollars more, he'd sell the company, never thinking that we would do that. Well, we gulped hard, we went back to our banks, and a few days later, we made the really great decision to buy that company, even with the extra two million dollars being demanded. I should explain that it wasn't a bad deal because we put up 18 million dollars and immediately turned around and did a uh, financing transaction which brought us back 12 million dollars on a sale and lease back. We found six million dollars of extra assets and working capital in the company, so we really bought it with no cash at all. But it was quite an undertaking at the time and a key decision in our growth. Over the next day, decade and a half, we did many things, we, um, including, uh, I won't talk about them tonight, we haven't got time. Uh, the only uh, one I'll mention is that we did invest in a television station, um, uh, investing $8 million in an independent television station, which was losing money at the time, and we were able eventually to turn that into $110 million after working at it for a number of years. Uh, we did other things. We financed film. We invested in a film company, Columbia Pictures. We introduced nationally the uh, Sunkissed Orange Soda products, which some of you may know. Um, we had a lot of fun. But the next key decision came in 1981. We were still looking for ways to diversify the company. We had um, our Pepsi-Cola business, which I've told you a little bit about. But we couldn't keep growing that because that can only grow when you can acquire franchises. And by this time, everybody was on to the game and the prices of these franchises had gone sky high. Our theaters were still producing more cash than they needed. So we spent a great deal of effort, as we do to this day, on looking for ways and means and directions into which to diversify the company. One of our studies led us to taking a look in depth at the wine business. And that led to the generation of a new concept. We called it investment with involvement. What that means for us, and it is a word of art that we coined, um, that instead of trying to pay a big market premium, as the stock market often demands for the acquisition of a company, we found or thought we could find the way to uh, acquire a good equity in a company by simply buying it at the market price up to a minority interest and then working with the company, getting involved with the company, trying to get on its board, making suggestions and stimulating the company and challenging it to do better so that the value of uh, the large minority interest that we would acquire in the public market would be enhanced. We tried to do this with a company three or four times our size in 1981 and 2, and that was the Hubline Company. Um, we didn't succeed because they didn't want our help. And uh, <laughs> I can understand that, uh, but we felt that we had failed, even though we walked away from that transaction with about $150 million of profit, which enhanced General Cinema's ability to go on and do other things. So key decision number five was to invest seeking involvement. Key decision number six, and I'm almost through, came in 1984. 
um, at which time General Cinema became a white knight. And in merger and acquisition parlance, that's the term for the company that comes and saves a, another company from being taken over by a hostile third party. We became a white knight for a West Coast department store chain called Carter Holly Hale. We made a significant, I think, $300 million investment in Carter Holly Hale uh, as a financial investment. We were, had a chance finally to practice investment with involvement. And we got involved on their board of directors in the key committees of that board. And we, in fact, did stimulate that company to do many things, some of which we think were very beneficial for that company, which had been um, perhaps um, in a period of uh, poor results for a number of years before we got there, and that's why they were looked at as a potential acquiree by so many others in the first place. The results of that investment with involvement finally bore fruit this past year, when after the company had reduced its uh, overextension of borrowings, we were able to engineer along with it a restructuring of that company. And from it, um, we gave birth to the Neiman Marcus Group. General Cinema went its way and took control of the Neiman Marcus Group, which is now a publicly owned New York Stock Exchange company. And Carter Holly Hale Management, through a, what is, I won't go into it, but it's a public leverage buyout, um, retained the department stores with increased equity for the management. And that, too, is still a public New York Stock Exchange company. So decision number six, made in a very few days, was to act as the white knight for Carter Holly Hale. Decision number seven was one of the hardest decisions that we've ever had to make, and that was made at about um, December 31st, I think, 1987, uh, 1986, excuse me. Um, and um, that was when another attempt to take over Carter Holly Hale uh, was launched by a company called The Limited uh, just before the restructuring plan that I've just spoken about was implemented. At that point, we had a very tough decision. Do we take about $750 million in cash, or do we take the stock of this retail group to be born, Neiman Marcus Group? We opted for the business. And I think we did it as much for the fun and the challenge and the opportunity because you couldn't justify it on money alone. And we've done that. Um, you all know that in 1987, the retail business um, took a dive, really, after October 19th. And uh, we are struggling with this company now, but we are very optimistic about its future. We're proud of the businesses that we have, and we're enjoying it. So that decision number seven did leave us on a combined basis with a corporation that now has about two and a quarter billion dollars of combined sales, about 23,000 employees, and an earning power of about $100 million a year. We look forward to many more interesting key decisions and challenges. Um, but as we um, undertook each one of these key decisions, um, I think I should just recap three or four of our principal characteristics as a company. First of all, this may seem unbelievable, but after 1960 and that itty-bitty stock sale to get us started, we never again used a significant amount of equity to finance the growth of this company. And that is almost unbelievable, the way we preserve the original equity for the benefit of its shareholders. And uh, we have an obsession about adding stockholder value. That's what we think we're in business for. That, we think, is our primary duty. And uh, everything that we do, every deal we look at, every action we take uh, is always taken with the thought, will it enhance shareholder value? Um, we also operate in a way that um, grants a great deal of divisional autonomy to the businesses that we do operate. Um, each of our businesses uh, report to us periodically, and we run the central bank and uh, manage their capital, but there is a great deal of autonomy in our theater division, our beverage division, and our three retail divisions. 
Finally, I, I should mention that we have evolved over the years into a managerial structure which is collegial. There are four members of the office of the chairman, uh, including myself, our uh, chief legal officer, Sam Frankenheim, who's here tonight, Bob Tarr, our chief operating officer, and Woody Ives, our chief financial officer. And um, all of us um, have a, um, a kind of a atmosphere of uh, mutual respect um, and absolute um, faith in each other's integrity that makes it possible for General Cinema to continue to do interesting and challenging things. Um, of course, you can't really tell the story of a General Cinema uh, in a few minutes like this. Uh, it's impossible. But I hope you get the idea of the cumulative effect of these linked decisions that were made over the years. And I've only tried to pick some of the high spots. It's possible that decision number eight might be coming up very, very soon in connection with our investment in a leading British company, Cadbury Schweppes. They're in the soft drink and confectionery business, um, worldwide, actually. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about that, because I can't tonight, and I've taken too much time anyway. But um, I hope you've enjoyed this, and I hope it shed a little bit of light on how we got here, and will give you some uh, the ability to intelligently guess where we might go in the future. <laughs> Thank you very much. president of a Fortune 500 company. However, he has certainly made an impact on the lives of those of us who live and eat in Newton. Cantina Bruzzi, the Dom and Mario Deli, the Bread and Chocolate Bakery, and the newly renovated MBTA train stop marketplace in Newton Center are all part of the Abruzzi companies. When Mario Bocabella first saw Newton Highlands, it reminded him of a little town in Italy, and he decided to bring street life and warmth to this corner of Newton. Not only has he given us food for the body in ample quantity, but Mario Bocabella is also the co-founder and president of Highland Jazz, an organization sponsoring jazz concerts in Newton Highlands. We are all very pleased that Mario has brought the best of Italy to Newton. Please welcome Mario Bocabella. Molto, uh, molto grazie. Nancy, thank you. I want a table. Io sono sindico da tutti, da tutti i cittadini di Newton, sono sindico, figlio maschi cent'anni. And whenever you see me a man, you can ask him, who taught you those words? And it was I, many, many years ago. Not really, I think he uh, knows his Italian very well. And uh, being in a Newton, uh, and being Italian in Newton, really uh, lent itself very nicely. Uh, being the 300th anniversary of Newton, and uh, one of its themes being, uh, let's look at where we came from to see where we are going. Uh, I do want to express some thoughts with you as to where I came from as a businessman and why I came to Newton and how your past and how your traditions, your feelings uh, help you decide what you want to do in the future in terms of planning a business and also planning your life. And I do have a challenge for you, Richard. How are you in making pasta? It could be your ninth <laughs> challenge, I guess. <laughs> I don't make it, I eat it. <laughs> Well, first you've got to learn how to make it. That's a thing. Um, I don't deal in the millions of dollars, of course, and uh, just a few, but we do deal in tons and tons of dough. Uh, <laughs> I'm say we're in the probably top 500 tonnage of pasta producers in New England. <laughs> but when I came to America with my family, and uh, these are very uh, key words in my own life and my own way of doing business. Family, when we came here in 55 as immigrants, uh, America was a fountain of gold, a fountain of youth, a, a way of resurrecting our own lives. Coming from a little village in Italy in Abruzzi, in the mountains of Abruzzi, we were probably no different than the sheep that we helped uh, graze and walk along the mountains. 
And coming here really afforded us the opportunity to show people what we could really do. Just give us a chance, let us use our hands and wit and determination, and we'll mold something for you. And uh, when I came to uh, New York, unfortunately, and I think fortunately at the same time, I landed in Brooklyn. And being in Brooklyn, I developed certain speech patterns that I still can't escape today. <laughs> Going back to Long Island and toity toy. But uh, landing in uh, New York and living in Brooklyn for my youth and going to school in uh, New York, St. Francis College, I was the first uh, of my family to go to college. As my brothers and sisters helped me go to college, they said, you don't work at all, you go to school, and you take care of what you've got to do. And at that time, I knew that I had to do more than just go to college and do my own thing. That there were many people behind me pushing and hoping and praying that this son of ours is not like a salami hanging from the uh, you know, uh, drying room and he makes something of himself. And I believe that we did, but it wasn't easy. Especially uh, when I became a teacher, my parents were extremely happy, because in Italy, of course, uh, these menial trades, like being a teacher, are called, you know, professore and dottoressa and maestro, and it sounds so beautiful, that being a teacher was an honor, and it really was. And being in New York and a teacher in New York was more of an honor, because you now had the tools to teach and to further teach others, and in this particular case, my own family. But being a teacher wasn't a very good idea because in those days, uh, teachers were making uh, $7,500 a year. I started making 68 because I was a regular per diem, temporary per diem, substitute teacher, and I was always fired in June and rehired in September. I never knew why, why I couldn't be there with the kids graduating and so on. I would always be looking outside from the fence, looking in, and then the principal explained to me, uh, Mr. Bernard Walker, and tonight, as a matter of fact, they're doing a testimonial for him, in New York that I would have loved to have gone, but Linda pleaded with me, please be there tomorrow night, but, and I am very happy to be here, but he is being retired this evening, and he really set the tone for me in terms of what it's like being a teacher and a model to people. I worked three jobs. My wife I stole from uh, a father in uh, Newton. She grew up in Newton Upper Falls. She also came from a little town in Little where I came from. And uh, when uh, we got married, her mother cried for weeks. <laughs> her father threatened me. Her uncles came to visit every weekend. <laughs> That's part of being an Italian and coming from an Italian family. <laughs> and God help me if I raised my voice or if there was any mark on her body. Because I was dead. Unfortunately, one time our first baby was born soon after, and uh, Angela, named after my mother, and uh, she happened to be sleeping between us in bed. I don't know what happened, but she came up and she just hit my wife on the face. And a china came out like you couldn't imagine. And of course, we had to come up to uh, Boston the following day. And it took me about three weeks to explain, as I ran around the house, that it wasn't my fault, it was my daughter's fault. Now, a six-month-old baby doing that is incredible, but it was. <laughs> but as I worked three jobs trying to make ends meet, and my wife would wait for me at 3 o'clock, 3.30 in the afternoon with a paper bag, you know, with a fruit and a sandwich, ready to jump off to another job. I used to work at the Staten Island Advance as a reporter and had the uh, midnight shift, and I think they called it the morgue, because nobody called, nothing ever happened in Staten Island, and boy, boy, was dead in there. So it gave me a chance to mark my papers, do my tests, and it was good while I was teaching. I also worked um, uh, as a night, the watchman bay for the YMCA in Staten Island, closing up for them. Now, I would see my wife for about a half hour a day. Good morning. Hello, sweetheart. Goodbye. Good afternoon, sweetheart. Goodbye. How was your day, sweetheart? Good night. <laughs> and it hasn't changed much since. <laughs> Hello, darling. How are you? <laughs> I'm glad you came tonight. It's good to see you. <laughs> when was the last time I talked to you, anyway? <laughs> Excuse us for two minutes. <laughs> well, did you pay the phone bill? No. But at that time, I knew I had to do something else. I mean, it was 
getting crazy. And uh, it was really, here's where I think luck occurs in business. You know, sometimes they say, boy, he's a lucky guy or she's a lucky woman. And what is it, what is it really luck? I mean, does it just happen? Does it fall on your face? Who knows? We had come up, I was teaching for seven years, and I came up here during our spring b uh, break. We came to see my wife's parents. And we were just talking, and uh, I was thinking, you know, it would be nice to own a business. You know, I mean, maybe just quit teaching and do something else with my 20 hours of labor a day, and maybe we can do something. And my wife and my brother-in-law said, well, let's, let's go out and look around and see what's happening. And of course, we went to Newton. They wouldn't think of any other town but Newton. Because they had grown up there, they loved the city, and they had to show me the little villagers in my house. Well, let's go, let's have a little fun. It was Sunday afternoon. I still had my paycheck in my pocket. It was $225 net. And uh, we went to Newton Center. And luckily, or fortunately, the store that we looked at had a for rent sign on it, and we called the owner that afternoon. Sorry, the store is taken, it's just rented. Oh boy. So we went to Center Street, going toward Route 9. We went by Route 9. My wife says, wait a moment, let's go have some ice cream. There's a nice little uh, village around the corner. We went right by it. We turned around, back onto Center, onto Walnut Street, and then lo and behold, this little village just opened itself to me. Says, this is great. This is tremendous. We had our ice cream, and across the street from Brigham's was a big sign for rent. It says, come on, this is incredible. We just missed the place, and here it is again. Let's hope this place is still for rent. We called the owner that evening. He came down. We met him at 8 o'clock that night. I gave him my paycheck. Now, we, I don't know how we got home that afternoon. I don't know. I gave him my paycheck, and I says, we'll see you in two weeks. We're going to start working. We had no idea what we were going to do. <laughs> we had no idea where we're going to get the money to do it, and we were going with it. But we knew we had to open a business. And of course, as we were talking, we were getting excited, and we had involved the entire family, the, the kids and the wives and the brothers and the fathers and the mothers and so on. And I said to us, well, what do we know best? I mean, we, we can't open a school. I, mean, I was teaching, but we can't open a school. What do Italians know best? <laughs> so, I ask you. Food. You know, we grew up with food. You know, we made the pasta at home. We made the salamis and the sausages. And we, we, you know, we had the walnuts and the grapes and the prosciutto and what have you. And, and luckily, living in Brooklyn, I had every taste, every aroma, every variety of food imaginable. I grew up on the billies. I grew up on knishes and meat and potatoes and what have you, egg cream sodas and Dr. Brown's uh, celery soda. I grew up on it. He says, wow, this is great. I said, but now what are we going to do? What kind of a deli do we open? What kind of food store do we open? And we want a little bit of this. We didn't want a restaurant, because we knew restaurant business is hard. My wife's family was in the restaurant business, and they were working day and night. I don't want that. I mean, I've been working day and night for seven years, and, we, and it got me no place. So let's just open a nice little store, make some money, go home, and relax. Sure. <laughs> it's that simple. But it isn't. We opened a delicatessen. We were the first, I think, delicatessen in the Northeast to have on the one roof kosher and Italian cold cuts. <laughs> we had separate cases, <laughs> separate slices. I mean, it was enough. There was a big expense. We had to have two of everything, separate cases, separate slices. And our very first customers, I mean, you just can't imagine this. Our very first customers are from New York. How's it going? The minute they open their mouth, do you have a cup of coffee? I said, wait a moment. <laughs> there's, there's a paisan in the room here. Are you from New York? Of course I am. How did you guess? Well, your coffee and your chocolate, I, 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 no problem. <laughs> and I was love at first sight, and we knew we had found a place that opened its heart uh, to us. And it was that simple. We knew that this was going to be the place in which we would make our future in our careers. And, uh, and ever since that point, many customers came to us. Boys, you've got to open a restaurant. This is all we've got. Everything we don't want to open, we have to open. I don't believe this. My brother-in-law came up a month later, my brother Dominic, brother-in-law Dominic. And he goes, I asked him, what do you think, Dominic? I'll be up in two weeks. He goes, what do you mean? He said, I'm leaving my job, I'll be up in two weeks. 
Now, where are we going to live? You know, I was living with my in-laws at the time. So Dominic moved in with my other brother-in-law, Antonin's brother. And outside of the whole family tradition of working together, living together, loving together, eating together, and thank God we're in the food business because we wouldn't have been able to do anything I would have starved. Because <laughs> that first year, we were doing, I think, uh, not too much in uh, pasta or anything. We did about $60 a day. My wife was still in New York for three months. I would send whatever I had to her. And she paid the bills by selling her paintings, which was a, she still is a very good artist. I said, Anta, do what you can, because I can't send you anything. I mean, do whatever you can. And she did. And she soon came up also, and it was like a breath of fresh air. Another family member pitching in. Wow, another person to work for nothing here. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but don't say that you still are, okay? Well, I don't see my paycheck at all. Right? <laughs> but you are. And um, we opened our restaurant in November of 76. Uh, the day was open in uh, June of 76. And uh, we didn't have enough money to buy dishwashers, so we used uh, paper plates and plastic forks. And uh, on our menu, we had the first thing we could make was a Parmesan. So we had any kind of Parmesan you wanted. Veal Parmesan, shrimp Parmesan, pasta Parmesan, anything Parmesan, we had it. Fry it, cheese, sauce, and it's done. But we happened to get brazen when I said, let's have a nice linguine al olio. I mean, people up here would love that, the smell of garlic and so on. So the first dish we made, the linguine al olio, the oil was so hot we put it on top of our plastic plate. It's a plastic separator. The paper was like, Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> linguine al olio falls over the place, okay, cancel that. No linguine al olio until we get our dishwasher and dishes. <laughs> so we were quite limited as to where we could go with our menu. <laughs> So we were finally able to get a dishwasher in uh, February of 77. And then we picked up our dishes and of course our menu changed. And I, I can't believe, once in a while we have our, we rolled back our prices. For our 10th anniversary we had uh, prices of 76 and we lost our shirt. <laughs> says, what are we doing? We should have lost money then too because, you know, shrimp parmesan for 325, I mean, it's just incredible. But something began, which was very interesting at that time. Almost a, uh, a kind of love relationship that occurs maybe between like the old time retailers where they know everything and you know, the kids stay there until the parents come home and they help them sweep and clean the windows and so on. A relationship began with our customers that today, uh, to this day, they're really immortalized by our menu items. You know, names like uh, Mrs. Fisher's Salad. Okay, Mrs. Fisher is a delightful woman. She's in the audience tonight, and she's probably hiding wherever there she is. And, uh, and here's a woman who took such delight and concern, I think for our welfare, but she probably felt so much pity for us that uh, <laughs> these boys need help or else they're going to starve here. But we have things, you know, like the, the chicken pasquale, named after a, um, a clarinetist for the BSO, Boston Symphony Orchestra. We have a Mali special. And... Uh, and an Antonio special, and uh, you know, Vio Bernard and Vio Brenda. And what began here was really an extension of our own kitchen at home. Make me something tonight, make it good, and then we'll name it. Forget what it's called. And it got to the point where we're having a little bit of battle as to who do we name dishes after because we're leaving some people out. And we began something to here again commemorate our many, many customers, our charter uh, membership you know, to our restaurant, where we actually honor every year those customers who really take so much concern and so much interest in our business. <coughs> and we really give them a lot of thanks for it. And every year, and as a uh, reporter in Staten Island, we, um, I did a story on a Chinese restaurant in uh, February, I believe, with the Chinese New Year, and this man had given away all the food, invited so many hundreds of people. I called him up, I asked, I'm very interested, why are you giving all this food away? I mean, what's the reason? Nobody gives anything away in New York. You have to pay for everything. He goes, well, we are here because of our customers, and we want to thank them and hope that they bring us more good fortune in the future. He goes, my God, that's incredible. I go, my God. Because that's something, you know? When I came up here, I remember that. I never forgot it. 
from our first year till this day, we have our annual thank you party. And it's gotten so big now that it's, it's crazy. But uh, we feed, you know, 3,000 people for free every year. That's a way of thank you. We don't care whether they've been there the first time or they've been there a hundred times. It's a way of saying to Newton and to our customers, what a hell of a place this is. And we would not ch have chosen another place except tonight. Thank you for being here this evening. is. 
and the cycle was starting to turn. People were disenchanted with investments and securities at that particular time. And it seemed, and as I traveled around the country in the real estate business, that a lot of people had a lot of interest in real estate. And it, that the trend was shifting somewhat in terms of investment opportunities. I also looked at northern New England, a place that I knew well. I had skied, we had a vacation home up in, on the Winnipesaukee area. And I went back to the Amos Tuck School at Dartmouth and sat down with one of my old professors who was a dear friend. And we started talking about a business opportunity, a business plan as they call it in business school. And I looked at the, the, the various factors that were coming together in northern New England. Recreation was increasing, the use of le leisure time, skiing and boating and swimming. An interstate highway system was being completed that we now know as Route 93 and Route 89 and Route 91, just then being completed. There was a, a transition in land use, which was quite interesting. Family farms in Vermont were going out of business because that generation was not being replaced by the next generation in farming. Their kids were leaving the farm and going to college and never coming back. And besides, a small family farm was no longer economically viable in competition with large Midwestern farms. Beautiful waterfront properties such as children's camps in New Hampshire and Maine were going out of business for some of the same reasons. The old camp director's children were not taking over. Also, children of the 60s, if you recall, the last thing they wanted to do was go to summer camp. They had other things on their mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there were a lot of things were starting to come together that if you observed the marketplace, you realize that there might be an opportunity for a conversion of land use from one kind of purpose to a new kind of purpose, the new kind of purpose being home, recreational and retirement homes. So I, formed, I formulated a plan, and the plan was to buy undeveloped land in northern New England, farmland and waterfront land, can put in, do a land use plan that would preserve its beauty, not divide it into a very large number of small pieces, and not to build condominiums, which then weren't even an, hardly a name, but to divide the land into large parcels and restrict it from being overdeveloped, and put in protective covenants so that people who wanted to buy a piece of that beautiful farm in Vermont would know that uh, uh, 50 years later it would still be beautiful and that the people around them who bought similar land would be uh, similarly preserved. But, and to do this within a two and a half hour drive mm. of Boston, which would mean it could be used for weekend use and people could build homes. Well, that was the concept. And it seemed like it might make some sense. And my professor friend said to me, you know, I think what you should do is you, sh is you should go to a consultant and find out if that business plan has viability. Would it work? And he recommended a friend of his at Arthur D. Little, one of the world famous consulting firms in Cambridge. So I called up this friend and told him that my old professor asked if I could come to see him, and I did, and he said sure. And I told him about my business plan. And he said to me, well, I think that's very interesting. He said, let me get a few of my young consultant people talking about that, and we'll get back to you and give you a uh, an idea of what it will cost for us to study and come up with a recommendation of whether this business plan will work. So I came home and told Sarah, well, boy, I'm going to get a, some good advice from Arthur D. Little. And sure enough, about a week later, they called, and they said they would be happy to undertake the feasibility study, that it would take about a year, and it would cost $50,000. <laughs> well, I neither had $50,000 nor a year's time, and besides, I figured I had done a little projection of what it might cost me to go into business and stay in business a year and fail. And it was about $50,000. <laughs> so I said to myself, now let's figure that one out. If I pay them $50,000 and they tell me that it, it will succeed, then I wished I hadn't done it because I might have been successful and without the $50,000. If I pay them $50,000 and they tell me it will fail, that's no worse than if I try it myself and fail. 
So I called them back and said, thank you very much, but I don't choose to take advantage of your <coughs> consulting study, and I think I'll start my own business anyway. So I did. And I, I did what you're not supposed to do. I had nobody with me in the company, and I had no capital to start with, but I had an idea. I also had <coughs> my wife, two children, a little, a little vacation cottage in a lake, and a home in Newton. But I said, what's the worst that could happen? The worst that could happen is that I fail, I put my resume together, and I go to Dick Smith or Jack Connors and I get a job. <laughs> so I figured I could always do that. So the first lesson in entrepreneurship is being willing to fail. That really is. You have to be willing to fail or none of us would have started our, our own businesses. Well, I looked around for a place to uh, locate and where else would I start but in Newton. And Sarah and I were driving along Washington Street one day like you, Mario, Mario looking for a place. And I think we stopped for an ice cream soda in Cabot's. And there was a little sign in Cabot's. Maybe you, all of you have been to Cabot's, I'm sure, and you know there are offices upstairs. And there was a little sign there on the door that said, Office for Rent. So we went upstairs <coughs> and met the Katsinases, who had been there for years, the lawyers who owned that building. And I said, where's the office for rent? And he showed me an office, about 200 square feet. And I said, what does it cost? And whatever it was. And I said, gee, that looks interesting. I think I'll rent it. He said, what are you going to do here? I said, I'm going to run a business. <laughs> he said, are you already in business? I said, no, but I will be on Monday. He said, do you have any credit? I said, no. <clears throat> but I guess he thought I looked sincere and what, what risk was it for him? The office was empty anyway. <laughs> so I rented one of his offices. We sh the, the deal was that we would share his conference room. That turned out to be wonderful because later when clients came up, they saw this beautiful conference room with all the legal books and so forth. And, I mean, I didn't make a point of telling them that it wasn't my conference room. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we got along famously. And I opened my business. Now the fact is, we had very little savings. <clears throat> what we decided to do was to shift the savings that we did have from the savings account <coughs> to a checking account. And then the idea was, and I think this was my wife's suggestion, that each week when we needed some money, you know, to buy the groceries and uh, for the, the family, that rather than my going to the account to make the withdrawal, she would go to the bank to make the withdrawal. Well, that turned out to be a wonderful strategy. Wonderful for me because I didn't have on my mind the fact that nothing was going into the bank and everything was coming out of the bank. It wasn't so wonderful on Sarah because she started getting headaches. <laughs> and she went for a checkup one day to the doctor and asked how she was. And she said, oh, I'm fine. I just have sort of persistent headaches. And he said, well, gee, I've just given you a complete exam and you're absolutely healthy. There's nothing that I can find. Is there anything new in your life? She said, well, nothing much. She said, my husband started a new business. And he said, isn't that wonderful? What's he doing? And she got into the story, and then she finally got to the point, he asked, how is it capitalized? She said, well, it's easy. I go to the bank every week, and I take money out of the savings and bring it to the star market. He says, that's why you have the headaches. <laughs> uh, that is a true story? <laughs> well, the little business did grow. Um, we were very undercapitalized. I say we. There's a wonderful thing about people who start businesses. They always talk about we. There wasn't a we, it was really I. <laughs> and in fact, the first few weeks, it was so quiet that, no, that the phone didn't ring, and I came home and told Sarah that the phone never rang. And then a couple of times every day thereafter, she would call me. <laughs> which, was, which was uplifting, it really was. <laughs> I think, oh, <coughs> I had, I had the, uh, <coughs> there's an old Italian expression called chutzpah, Mario. <laughs> And I decided that to launch my new business, I would call the Boston Globe, and I would talk to the real estate editor and tell him that a new business was being founded, and that I would send in a little article about the business. Uh, it's marvelous what public relations will do. And he thought it sounded interesting what I was going to do, so I wrote it up, but I took it to the secretary.
secretarial service. I didn't have a secretary, and they typed it up, and then I sent it down in the mail. And lo and behold, the next Sunday, an article comes out with a picture and everything about this new Northland Investment Corporation founded in Newton. Tells about the concept, land in northern New England and all that. It was wonderful, and that started some business coming. One day, I got a phone call. Obviously, I had no employees. I couldn't afford my, my, to pay myself, let alone any employees. And one day, I get a call from a young man who says that he read, read about my company. First, he said he was so surprised to get through to the president. <laughs> Fortunately, it was lunchtime, so I said, gee, my secretary must be at lunch. <laughs> and and he, uh, he said this was just the kind of business that he had, had, had thought about, and he'd love to come over and talk with me about it. Well, I thought he was a customer. So I said, sure, come on over. He had just gotten out of Harvard, and a uh, nice-looking young man and came over to see me that afternoon. It was a Friday. I remember that well. And we sat and talked about the business. He had no money, so he was clearly not a customer. And he said, I'd like to go to work for you because I could sell the kind of land and help you buy some of these farms and help you sell and so forth. I said, well, that's a wonderful idea. But I said, there is no money to pay you. This company has just started. He said, that's all right. He said, my wife and I, next fall, when she gets out of nursing school, are going to go to Europe. And, and we're going to get an old camper and we're going to spend a year in Europe. And I have between now, which was roughly April and September, and I'm looking to do, to do something. And I'll work. I'll work for you for nothing just to learn the real estate business and to learn about this kind of, kind of industry. I said, you've got to be kidding. He said, no. He said, I'll do that. And if, you, if you'll agree to teach me the business and buy me lunch at Cabot's, <laughs> I'll work for nothing. Well, I said, fine. I said, if you really believe that, and he was a really sharp-looking, bright young man, and I said, you show up Monday morning at 8 o'clock, and you've got a job. <laughs> job. <laughs> I, went, I went home and said to Sarah, I told her the story. She said, you don't think that guy's going to show up. <laughs> so I said, well, we'll find out. Monday morning at 8 o'clock, I go upstairs in Cabot's, and he's on my doorstep waiting there. Well, he worked for me <coughs> that entire summer, from then through September, and we each kept our promise. He showed up for work every day, and I didn't pay him anything. <laughs> <laughs> and when he left for Europe, he said, I want to ask you to do one promise. He said, if this company makes it, when I get back in about nine months, he said, if you're going to hire your first employee, I want to be that person. I said, okay, we'll see what happens. So he left. Well, the company started to make it. I hired a secretary, and business started coming in. And about April of the next year, I, really, I needed to hire somebody because business was getting too much for me alone. And I had his itinerary he used to keep in touch, and I wired him. And I said, I don't know whether you want to do this, but I'm hiring my first employee. If you want to cut your trip short, you got a job, a real job. Now, wire came back. I'll be there Monday morning. <laughs> Some of you in the room know who that is. He's a resident of Newton, and his name is Peter Barber. And he's been with me ever since. He couldn't be here tonight because he's on a vacation in Bermuda, and I'm working. <laughs> But obviously, he's my partner and stockholder, and uh, you can imagine the feeling we have for one another after now 18 years together. And so that's just the story of how my first employee came, came to work for me. Well, <coughs> those early days were difficult. We did, we did realize that, that we needed some capital, and we figured out two ways to put capital together. We invited a few people who knew me to invest in the company because I needed some base capital. Once I knew the concept was going to work, about six months later, I went to five friends. And I told each of them what I was doing. And I said, here is what I need, probably to capitalize the company for a year. And if you would like you, to invest in the company, I will essentially sell part of the stock of this fledgling little company to you to be my base stockholders. And each of the five, who were from five different industries, each of whom knew me well, many of whom lived in Newton and still do, took me up on that. And they invested what today would be considered a very uh, minimal amount of money to become the seed capital for my company. They too, I'm proud to say, are still stockholders and, uh, and directors of the company. 
and I'm going to come home tonight and figure out whether if they spent five cents in 1970 it would be worth $18 today. But I have a feeling that the numbers would probably be almost as good as, uh, as yours. The other way we needed capital was that as the company grew, it was going to buy real estate. And it needed separate kinds of money to purchase the farmland or whatever. And we put together what's known as a limited partnership. Simply stated, investors putting money with us, we were the general partner, and they were the limiteds, and that funded each real estate transaction. In the early days, um, farms and waterfront property and later commercial property. And I'm proud to also say that some of the people who were the first limited partners with me back in 1970 and 71 are still limited partner investors with me <coughs> in projects that we do today. Now, as in Dick Smith's business, the changes occur. And there were several strategic changes in our company as well. The first major thing that happened to us is that when things were just getting rolling about 1974, of course, <coughs> Our friends in the Middle East turned off the spigot, and the Arab and the oil crisis uh, ensued. And as you recall, people were lined up in Washington Street to get their cars filled with gasoline. And, let, and if they couldn't have enough gasoline to drive to the office, they certainly weren't going to decide to, draw, to buy this beautiful piece of farmland in Vermont because they didn't think they were ever going to get there. <coughs> Interest rates soared. We were in a recession, and our business ground to a halt in northern New England recreational real estate business uh, almost stopped. So we were faced with a very interesting strategic business decision. Do we change the nature of our company or do we go out of business? Well, that seemed to me somewhat like the Arthur D. Little story. What could you lose by changing? So we decided to diversify. <coughs> and diversified to us was to take a look at what our strengths were and what were they. We knew something about real estate. I had had some prior experience in commercial real estate. We had investors who were happy and would put money with us. We had some banking relationships, and we knew in New England. The question was, what kind of real estate would be somewhat recession-proof? Well, we came across a medical office building on the theory that the one kind of tenants who probably were going to continue to stay in business and pay the rent were doctors. So, we, so our first purchase was a medical office building in Kenmore Square, a little old building that we fixed up and and suddenly the few people who were with me at that time who had been dealing in land up north became building managers. Overnight, they became building managers. And we, bought, we converted an old industrial building out in the suburbs um, that had state tenants, Commonwealth of Massachusetts tenants, to a little office building. And that essentially got our company into the commercial real estate business. Necessity, economic conditions externally driven. From there, other cycles <coughs> happened, other strategic changes, such as deciding that we could add value more substantially to real estate if we, if we bought distressed property that needed help and brought management expertise to it, a shopping center in Burlington that was half rented, and that we thought that if we could buy right, we could rent it up and we could expand it, which we did, the, uh, the Lomans Plaza that you probably know in Burlington. <coughs> we bought um, office buildings that down on State Street in the mid-70s that nobody wanted. And uh, that turned out to be a good thing to have done. Um, we, we generally went to different places in New England and identified real estate that for one reason or another had a problem that we thought through hard work we could fix the problem, improve the prob property, and add value. That became a strategic plan <coughs> of Northland and still is to this day to add value to, to existing real estate. With that experience, we got into the development build business. And the first property that we ever developed from scratch was the Marshall Shopping Center here in Newton on Needham Street, when Needham Street was passable um, <laughs> in the days when you drive on Needham Street. And we bought the old property there from what was St. Regis Paper, knocked down the old buildings, and built a shopping center. <coughs> we did the same thing um, on the corner of Route 16 and 128, where our current building is. And we've done new construction uh, from Portland, Maine, to Hartford, Connecticut, uh, where we're at basically in markets from Port <coughs> Portland and Providence and Hartford and southern New Hampshire and greater Boston. Today, 
the company has thrived and we're proud of it. It's thrived because of a lot of people. We now have 105 people who work for Northland and I think one of the things I'm most proud of is that the five senior people who joined me from 1971 to 1975 are all still with the company. They're with us, they're my partners, stockholders, participants in all of our projects, and the senior managers of each of our divisions. Today the company has about 42 separate real estate projects, either under construction or existing, about 3 million square feet, uh, with a market value of approximately $300 million, all located in New England and all centralized in Newton. I think I'm going to end so that we'll have plenty of time for questions by mentioning what I call, and in some lectures I've given at business schools, the 10 C's <laughs> of entrepreneurship. And it just happens they start with the letter C, and one day I started thinking about these things, and I think it's, in, it's sort of a, an interesting <coughs> capsule and maybe an interesting summary on our symposium tonight. The first one is courage. As I said earlier, you really need courage to sort of start your own business. And you have to have the courage of your own convictions. The second is concept. Remember I said earlier, you better have some sort of a concept, whether, it's, whether the consultants tell you it's good or not. The third is capital. The single largest problem that young companies run into is lack of capital. The fourth is confidence. You have to have a lot of that to go it on your own. The fifth is consistency. It seems to me that one has to set certain goals and to manage by objectives. The sixth is creativity. You have to be imaginative and have some vision and take a chance and take a bigger perspective on a business that maybe others haven't looked at. The seventh is change. The world will change whether you like it or not. You, ha you can't be too rigid. You have to try to be flexible and meet market demands. The eighth is challenge. Being in your own business is a challenge, and you have to be willing to face problems head on, even those that you don't expect. The ninth is contacts. I don't think I could have started my company and been as successful as we've been fortunate enough to be without being in the city in which I grew up, and in the community where we had contacts in the banking community with investors and with a lot of people who knew who, who we were. And finally, the tenth is control. If you do it, structure it so that as to master your own destiny. And if you do that, you'll probably be successful. And I'm delighted to have been invited to join you tonight. Thank you. diversity, entertainment, history, and perspective to all of us. Um, if Bob Danziger ever gets bored with real estate, he can certainly be an entertainer. I <laughs> promise to market him well. He had no trouble following Mario at all, and I, for a moment, breathed deeply over that one. Now, um, I will entertain questions from the audience. The way I need to do it, because this is filmed, I didn't tell the participants that before. This is all being filmed for cable. I will repeat the question, not because I haven't heard you, but because television demands it. So who shall be the bravest? C for courage. <laughs> Do we have a question from the audience? Do we have a question from the panelists? You have a question. I have a question, yes. Is your Tokyo office now one of your busiest? Is that a large market for you now? The question was directed at Jack Connors. The question is, is the Tokyo office one of your busiest now? If I said Tokyo, I didn't mean to say that it's Hong Kong. And uh, Hong Kong is, in fact, uh, a growing operation, but there's a lot of change going on in Hong Kong as well, uh, with 1997 not too far away and mainland China taking over the island at that time. So it's, uh, it's a period of change there, but there's a lot of opportunity uh, in change as well, as I guess is one of the 10 Cs. 
So it is, it is the smallest of uh, four asses, but it represents uh, some of the better margins and some of the better opportunities over time. Yes. I'd like to address the panel. enough to change and in that 
that was the first diversification that our company sought. And I think that um, that setback has uh, stood us in good stead in that when, when markets change, and markets constantly change, um, in our business, if Boston becomes, which in my judgment it has, uh, overbuilt and overpriced, and our principal area of business had been Boston, uh, two years, or three years ago, we went to Portland, Maine, because we felt that there were not economically justifiable real estate values anymore in Boston, and so we sought a new market. Uh, if office buildings uh, in general are, are no longer viable from an economic investment standpoint, um, we started an industrial park. So I think one of the lessons that at least we learned is that, is that life changes constantly, and you better be flexible enough not to have, in the famous, um, in the words of the famous Harvard Business School professor, don't have marketing myopia. You know, he was the one that wrote that wonderful article that said and that if the railroads had seen themselves in the transportation business, they would own the airlines. <laughs> yes. things at once. 
the other day we were driving to the airport and we saw someone shaving with one of those razors while he was driving. <laughs> and then you see all these people walking and jogging, listening to the news and getting their entertainment at the same time. And there's uh, all of these uh, fast food restaurants where people can get in and get out very quickly. I mean, try, uh, for the most part, to take a nine-year-old child to a, to a sit-down tablecloth restaurant and see how much fun they have uh, sitting there for 15, 20 minutes going through you know, the, the wonderful ceremony that takes place in a good uh, linen tablecloth restaurant. So there's all kinds of changes taking place, and uh, it's, it's a healthy process to be able to anticipate them. Yes. With all the, uh, I guess, leverage buyouts in particular, and all, a lot of the cash being used to finance the debt, <laughs> is there a word in the last few years in terms of the economy? Is there a word in that? If the economy is so sad, a lot of these companies are going to be sad with the normal debt burden, and will not be able to meet it, and a lot of large companies that have it, and you know, leverage buyouts might even fail, and during the whole time, the economy is going to be subject of the next symposium. Mm -hmm. I, I'll answer quickly. Um, and it, it I've is just been rescued. <laughs> uh, symposium. Uh, there will be some failures in some of the companies that have been over leveraged, but the, uh, therein lie the seeds for future opportunities for those who have buying power and have cash or access to financing. I think America is benefiting greatly on balance by the wave of takeovers, because it has forced and challenged managements to focus primarily on the welfare of their stockholders. There are evils in the system, like too short-term a focus on the welfare of the stockholders. But on balance, I think it's been good, and I think there will be future opportunities that will come in the wake of just the kind of over-leveraging you're talking about. And, uh, yes, the gentleman in the pink sweater. Of your own destiny, that in fact, if you are willing to grow, 
uh, there is the opportunity in this town, in this village, in this state, in this country, uh, in this world, uh, for that growth to occur. Other respondents? I, I, I'd be happy to. Um, I, I agree with Jack. I think you need mentors, one way or another. And, and you need mo model concepts, if it's a concept you're talking about, that someone else has done at least something similar. In my case, I think I mentioned that very early in the game, I invited five people to join my board of directors, if you will, or to form what was became a board of directors. I carefully sought out five people who had basically three things in common. They were all older than I was, by at least a half a generation. In my judgment, they were also wiser, and they all had experience in different disciplines that would bring something to my business. One was head of a construction company, and I knew I was going to get into <coughs> real estate development. One was head of a major retail organization, a national retail chain, and I was going to get into the shopping center business. One was an attorney, and I knew if you're in the real estate business, you're going to do a lot of business with lawyers, and so on. One was an investment banker who had, who had access to capital markets. Each of these men became very intimate friends of mine, as well as business associates. And they were in many ways were mentors. And since I, like Jack, didn't have anyone else that I could go to when I started the business, they became uh, teachers and mentors and people uh, against whom I could bounce ideas. And that, that became very important in the growth of my company. Since it is now five after 10, we shall adjourn. There will be a reception, and I am sure that the panelists will be available for some conversation and perhaps a drop of refreshment. Thank you all for coming.